Hello, Frizzle Formation. I'm going to be reading Warrior Born and The Olympian Affair, the two newest books in the Cinder Spire series. We got a novella, then a novel, and I adored book one of the series. So I am so excited to read these new ones and bring you along. So first I read the novella Warrior Born, and this follows one of my favorite characters from book one, who never got a perspective in book one, so I'm very happy to see his perspective here. And this is Benedict. Benedict has an interesting place in society because he is a warrior born, which is like the cat people, and they're really strong and great fighters and outcasts. But Benedict has an extra source of tension in his place in society because he's also part of the higher class. So he's like respected because he's from this wealthy family, but he's also not respected because they just see him as this animalistic kind of person. And throughout book one, he's always fighting to be seen as normal. He's trying to play down his warrior born aspects. He's trying to play down his cat aspects. He's really just trying to fit in and be a member of society that is really dependable. And in the story that takes place after book one, Benedict has been proven dependable, and he is now being sent on secret missions for the ruler of the spire. The surface world is incredibly dangerous, so all the humans live in these big, ancient spires with like hundreds of levels and thousands of people living on each level. So Benedict gets sent on a mission to a different spire to do some reconnaissance because a war is brewing and they need some information over there. And what I found was so impressive with this novella is how it tackles the themes of like how the warrior born work in society. Everyone acknowledges that these are the best fighters and the best people to send on a mission. So the team that gets sent that Benedict's in charge of is all war Warrior born. But also, warrior born are just like always given the most dangerous jobs without getting like any social respect from it. And it, there's definitely a feeling that people don't care as much if the warrior born live or die, and that's another pro of putting them in all these dangerous situations. And because Benedict is just desperate for this social approval, he's just going to do anything he can to be useful, even when the society is pushing him too far. So, this novella was exquisite. It was a nice contained adventure. Benedict was as fun as always. We got to see a little bit wider of the world and what the villains are doing in different places in this novella. And we also got some really fun moments with some new cats there. That's one of the other things I love about these books is they have talking cats and they are absolutely fantastic characters. So I would give Warrior Born five stars. I think it absolutely nailed giving us Benedict's perspective, setting up the coming conflict for book two with this war brewing. So Cinder Spires, it's coming off to a really good start. Hello, I am about 20% into the Olympian Affair. And honestly, I'm not the most jazzed about it at this point. Like I love getting back into the swing with characters. That's a blast. Let me break down some of these characters for you. We have four point of view characters. First one I'll talk about is Bridget. Bridget is a member of the Guard, and one of her distinguishing features is that she has a relationship with the local cat population. The cats in this book, they're smart, they talk. And her best friend cat is named Ral. Bridget also has a love interest named Benedict who's always hanging around, and he is the protagonist of Warrior Born, which I just told you about. Our next POV is Lady Abigail Hinton, a noblewoman, and her distinguishing characteristics is she's rich and she's very invested in her lover, whose name is Bayard. No, I don't love that this female character's motivations is reduced to pretty much only protecting her lover, but at least she's our protagonist instead of her male lover, you know? Bayard is good friends with our next point of view character, Captain Grimm. Captain Grimm pilots the airship Predator, who goes on missions. The second in command of his airship is Gwen, who in book one was part of the guard with Bridget, but she has now moved on. She's also Benedict's cousin, which I don't think ever really becomes plot relevant, but they have a connection. Then we have Colonel Aspira, our last point of view character, and he is on Team Babby. He is muscle on the airship that is transporting Madame Cavendish. So all of these people are from Spire Albion, which is our, like, good guys, and Espira and Madame Cavendish are on the side of Spire Aurora, which, yeah, they're pretty bad. They do a lot of mass murder. So Madame Cavendish is such a good villain because she is an evil, unhinged wizard. They call them etherealists. 
And those are all of the important characters. I'll be talking through all of their plots as we go. So seeing all of those characters again, I love it. I'm here for it. But I'm 20% into this book, which is quite a few hundred pages in because this book is long and it still feels like nothing has really happened. In book one, we had this war breaking out and it was a big deal because war was starting. And now there's been a two year time gap between the books, which I do love because it enables the characters to be in different places than they were at the end of the last book. But still, two years later, the war has not really progressed much. Nothing has happened with it in that time gap. And now it seems like the main plot of this book that we're gearing up towards is just like a political summit at a different spire. <laughs> and I'm kind of feeling like, who cares? Why does it matter? Like the war is already going to be happening. Spire Albion is all for war. What are our characters really hoping to accomplish here? Now, there is the rumblings of a larger plot to come because there is this big doomsday weapon in the possession of Spire Albion that can just destroy whole airships and towns. And we haven't yet gotten a close look really of what this is. It's implied that it might be some sort of ghost monster thing. So I'm definitely excited to see more of that and see if our characters will confront it or can destroy it. But the fact that they're barely even aware of the existence of this monster at this point, but even with this looming threat, even knowing that the bad guys have the ability to destroy everything right now, it still doesn't feel like really anything's happening because all the characters are just in this holding pattern where they're just traveling around and still in the setup. Anyway, I have great hope that this book will improve, but so far it's just, hey, I know that character, I like that one, and like, fine writing, and I, nothing's happening. Right now, I'm feeling like this book is too long. Like, I've only read 20% of it, and there's already a few scenes that I'm like, oh, we didn't really need that one, it could have just been cut out. There's already like a perspective that I don't care about and feel like it could get cut out. The Abigail Hinton that it seems like her whole goal right now is just to protect her husband, who is a character that I don't care about on an errand that I don't care about. I think the epitome of some scenes that could just be cut out is the whole subplot right now with the cats. And it just feels like so many steps where nothing is really happening. We're not really getting to know the new cats. Our characters that are going on these fetch quests aren't being challenged or growing or learning anything new about the world in this way. It's just getting shuffled from place to place. It doesn't feel like the stakes are being raised. It just feels like we're going around a boring track in circles. Hello, I've gotten 40% through the Olympia Affair and it hasn't gotten better, but I'm very excited to talk to you about the ways it's gotten worse. So I think the biggest offender here is the cat's plotline and I want to break this down for you a little bit about why this plotline is so boring. So our goal here is we've got some cats and they need a new home. The goal is to find a new home for these cats. They have some important political secrets that they will tell our protagonists once they have a new home. So first they go talk to the human leader, the Spyrarch, the leader of their handy dandy Spire here. They go talk to him and ask him, where can we house these cats? They need a home in order to get these political secrets. And our tippy top human leader here says, you know, I think you need to ask the cats that question, which is fair. So step two. So Bridget and her cat sidekick, Raoul, go off on the adventure to go ask the local cats. And there are several scenes of them journeying around in the tunnels looking for the cats where not much happens. And then they finally find the cats. And you know what the cats say? You're gonna have to go ask a different cat. And all that is known about this cat is that it likes to live on the surface. So then our crew must go down to the surface and look for a specific cat in order to get permission to rehouse the other cats. So then after a few scenes of them journeying to the surface of the spire, which is very dangerous, and of course they have to talk about that for a while, they talk to the people there and they ask them where they can find this cat. And the people say, you know, you have to ask the other person, you know, the etherealist wizard guy. So then they have to like take a hike around a spire to find the etherealist. And when they finally find his home, there's a sign that's like, hey, I went fishing. So now they have to go on another little quest to try to find where he went fishing. And that's where I'm at right now. For every single one of these steps, there's like at least two scenes. Two scenes where nothing is happening. Two scenes where we are not learning anything more about the plot where we are not learning anything more about the characters, where they're not learning anything about their relationships, where there's no world building really being done. It's just like 12 scenes of talking to different people, asking if they can house the cats, and them saying, no, go ask another person. 
and we haven't even gotten to the solution yet. There's probably gonna be several more steps. And like none of these were necessary. None of these steps progressed the story in any meaningful way. I feel like there's a time when a bunch of intermediate steps can be a good thing for a story, and that's when every single one of those steps is increasing the stakes is making it so the characters will lose more the more that they get into this quest. None of these are really increasing the stakes, except going to the surface. It's more dangerous, but it doesn't really feel that dangerous because our characters are very competent warriors and they can handle themselves, you know? Another time when having this many steps along a quest can be a good one is even though we're not making progress towards our goal of rehoming the cats, if we were making progress towards other things, like a relationship between two characters, or our protagonist's character arc, or solving a different mystery along the way. But none of that is happening. It is just boring talking to people and like mini side quests after side quests. And I am so sick of this plotline with Bridget and Raoul and Benedict just talking to people, trying to find a home for these cats. Now let's talk about some of these other plot lines. We have the plot line of Captain Grim. At the beginning of the book, he started traveling towards this peace summit at Spire Olympia. And so far in the book, he has arrived at the Spire Olympia. Let me check my notes. Yeah, that's it. That's all he's done, is arrive. And I have no idea what he's doing there. He seems completely pointless, and his plotline is utterly boring. Then we have the plotline of Abigail Hinton a little bit more entertaining because she's also gone to this peace summit and she actually has a goal there, right? Big step up from the plotline of Captain Grimm. Her goal there is to try to make sure her lover, Bayard, doesn't get into trouble because there's people that are trying to kill him. And over the course of her doing various political machinations, you know, having conversations with people in boring ways, she's gotten herself involved in a dangerous duel, which is like kind of interesting, but it still feels so lackluster because it doesn't have any bearing on the larger plot of any of the other characters. Like this isn't going to affect the war effort and it doesn't really feel like it's affecting her personally that much. She's just doing it for her lover. And then we have my favorite plot line right now, which is Colonel Aspira, the enemy soldier guy. So the more ruin and destruction that he sees his own side perpetrate, the more conflicted he's becoming until now he's starting to talk with people about planning a rebellion from the inside, a little mutiny. Has he actually done any of the planning yet? No, he, but he has discussed maybe planning in the future a mutiny. So something is happening in Aspira's plotline that affects both the other characters in the book and his own internal conflicts. And that's like the best thing I could say about any of these plot lines, which is so disappointing because I just read the novella and I loved it because the plot line was like so focused and like deep with character emotions and the inner conflicts and everything. And then we have this book where it has none of that. And I'm like, what even happened? This book is so long. It's over 600 pages and so far it is not justifying its page length at all. Speaking of someone who reread book one like a month ago, book one was so much better. <laughs> book one was just as long, but it was so tight. Every scene mattered. I loved every plot line. And then we have this one. And I'm gonna keep reading it because I care about the series and the author and I'm hoping it gets better. But if it hadn't been written by an author that I trusted, I would have given up on this book by now. Good morning. It's time to make some breakfast and I am very excited about what I'm gonna make today. We are going to make some toast out of some homemade cheese bread that I made yesterday. We are going to put pesto on top of that, which is also homemade. And I'm gonna make some scrambled eggs to put on top of everything. And it's going to be really yummy. In the meantime, I'm also going to tell you how I'm feeling about 75% in of the Olympia affair. So in the last little bit of the book, Bridget rehoping the cats plot did go somewhere. They got home for the cats after, yes, several more pointless steps, of course. Why else would they do it any other way? And along the way, there's been flirting between Bridget and Benedict as they've been going on this quest for the cats. But honestly, I found it pretty underwhelming and boring as well. Even though I ship them very hard, their flirting is just so subtle that like it doesn't give anything. Then we have Abigail's plotline and hers did indeed go somewhere. I was telling you last time that she was starting to get involved in the duel. She did fight that duel and honestly the duel scene was fantastic. Like I loved it. It's in the middle of the duel honestly. Suddenly it gave stakes to the fight and her character so in the end the duel was pretty satisfying. I do kind of wish that those stakes had more been there like before the fight had started but you know I'll take what I can get. 
And now that her duel is done, she's starting to get involved in the larger plot of the war that's going on, which is starting to finally heat up, and I'll tell you about that in a second. Then we have Captain Grimm's plotline. Before, all he did was arrive at Spire Olympia. But in the last chunk of the book, he got involved in a duel, and honestly, that duel scene was even better than Abigail Hinton's duel scene. It was exquisite. My favorite moment of the book so far. So well paced and the action was so crisp. And again, it felt like it actually had personal stakes. I think one of the things that the book hasn't done very well with these two duels is that like, it's trying to pretend that these duels are important to the larger war effort. It's like, these ones are against the enemy nation or people in the enemy nation. And so if we lose them, it'll be bad for our soldiers morale or something. But like, it doesn't feel like that'll actually make any difference. You know, these are just like two duels. And the book hasn't really showed me that like morale is really struggling otherwise, you know? It hasn't shown me why that's important in any way. Then we have the plot line of Colonel Aspira on the enemy warship and him plotting his mutiny because he doesn't like all the murdering of innocent civilians that they've been doing. So that plot line, remember how it was my favorite? Well, now it's one of my least favorites because what happened in the last little bit was he did a mutiny and then it failed. And then he did another mutiny and it failed. And all the scenes in there were so boring and like underwhelming and like how can you have a mutiny scene be boring and underwhelming but it was and it happened twi twice they did not need either of those anyway so now with all of these plot lines finally the enemy armada with their secret weapons and all that stuff are attacking Spire Olympia so now all the plot lines are coming together it finally feels like the book is getting into gear right now I'm kind of like if you ask me to rate this based on what it's been so far I'd give this book two stars but it does look like the ending is shaping up to be something like explosively bombastically fun. So if the book sticks the landing, might just give it three stars. It feels like this book so far has been doing like really lame slow motion somersaults. And then finally here at the 75% mark, it's like, here, watch me do a quadruple backflip. And I'm like, okay, if you stick the landing, I might give you a star for that, you know? Just the entire beginning and middle of the book has been so lackluster that like, I don't know how invested I really am in any of this. Anyway. That's the update. That's how I'm feeling about this book at 75% and it's kind of disappointing. But you know what's not disappointing? This breakfast. Cheese bread, pesto, scrambled eggs. Breakfast for two and it's gonna be so yummy. I finished The Olympian Affair. Did it stick the landing? Yes, it did. So I gotta say, from 70% of this book on, those pages and chapters were good. And if this book had just been like literally half the length, I could have really, really loved this one, but we had that entire beginning section dragging it down. But here we have this ending lifting it back up. Finally, this war that we have been building up towards since the beginning of book one finally breaks out. There's a lot of fighting, there's big secret weapons, there's armadas of airships fighting each other. And through this, in the end, we really focus on Captain Grimm and Colonel Aspira's plot lines, because they're the ones most involved in these airship battles, which are beautifully plotted and executed, and I really felt the stakes of these ones. Especially Captain Grimm's chapters. Aspira's are still a little lackluster, I gotta say. And here at the end of the book, we really transition to focusing more on Captain Grimm as he's involved in all of these airship battles and shenanigans going on here at the climax. Some of our characters get a happy ending and some of them get a more dangerously tragic ending that makes me really excited to read more in the sequels here. Now a lot of points in the first half of this book I was legitimately considering um, giving up on it, just DNF. And I am glad I think that I made it to the end because the end was quite solid. Like suddenly we had a plot. Suddenly that plot was supported by emotional moments. Suddenly the characters had motivations and things to do and things that were on the line that they cared about. What? I know it's crazy. So like if I was talking to someone who like me read like the first 10% and was like, is this book going anywhere? I would recommend skip to like 60% and just pick up there. Don't worry. You're not missing anything. <laughs> I think part of why this book feels so disjointed with the first half and the second half is because of the way it was written. Most books by Jim Butcher, the author, have been written in very short time frames. For a large part of his writing career, he's turned out like a book a year or more. But this is one of the books that comes after a very long hiatus. And so he was writing it over many, many years. And like, I don't know his exact writing process, but I assume 
that that's part of why this book feels so lackluster and like it's losing its momentum for large stretches is because maybe the writer was losing its momentum for large stretches. Like I just read Warrior Born, a book that was finished at like the same time of a, as Olympian Affair. And I loved that one. And I feel like that's because it was like a little bonus novella that maybe wasn't written alongside everything else. And it's just like so sad to me that we had this wonderful novella and then we had this bloated novel back to back when you could have cut out so much of the fluff of that novel, added in the scenes from the novella, and everything would have been so strong. So in the end, I'm giving Olympian Affair three stars. One star for a large stretch in the middle and like five stars for this little stretch in the end and it averages out to three. If you enjoyed this video, I think you'll love watching my review of book one next.